Funding for NJ Spotlight News is provided by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association, the PSEG Foundation, and by the Fuel Merchants Association of New Jersey and Smart Heat NJ. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Finozzi. Hello, and thanks for joining us this evening. I'm Rhonda Schaffler, in for Brianna Venosi. Governor Murphy's campaign got some Democratic star power today as First Lady Jill Biden visited the Garden State to show her support for Murphy. She is just one in a list of party bigwigs who are making high-profile visits here to cheerlead for the governor's campaign, including President Obama next week. But this isn't just about photo ops. As Joanna Gagas reports, these visits are a sign that the Murphy campaign is taking nothing for granted, even as he maintains a lead in the polls over Republican hopeful Jack Chitterelli. The First Lady of the United States of America, Dr. Joe Biden. With just over two weeks till the election, Governor Murphy's bringing out the big guns. I came here to ask the people of New Jersey to re-elect Bill Murphy as your next governor. First Lady Jill Biden joined Murphy on the campaign trail today. What a great governor you have! And Joe and I know Phil. We know that he's going to fight for you and your family every single day. It's quite simple. Our team shows up, we win. Our team doesn't show up, this thing's a coin toss. Last week, it was Vice President Kamala Harris. <laughs> and next week, it'll be former President Barack Obama. It's an indication that Democrats are playing like the race isn't all wrapped up. And it's not, so that's smart. Over in Jack Chitterelli's camp, it's more about who you won't see coming through, like former President Donald Trump, as Chitterelli told our David Cruz during Tuesday night's debate. A no to him campaigning with me? Yes. Uh, David, I go out there and campaign on my own. I'll win my own election. Okay. But as much as Chitterelli's distancing himself from Trump, he's still calling on GOP support to push him over the top. Late last night, uh, the Republican National Committee Chair, Rona McDaniel, announced that she's going to be coming in to campaign for Jack Chitterelli. Um, next week. And so this is something that we're going to be seeing for both campaigns over the next two and a half weeks between now and the election. But who and more importantly, when a national surrogate hits the campaign trail can tell you a lot about the candidate's confidence in the race, says pollster Patrick Murray. Bringing in surrogates at this particular point uh, a couple weeks before the election is a sign that, you know, you really want to make sure your base stays energized, particularly with uh, early voting uh, starting just around the corner. He says timing is everything. And when you see national figures coming through in the last days. At that late stage, when you really should just be focusing on getting out the vote, uh, you know, then that says, you know, you're, you're trying to change something. But Murphy recently did change something. George Helmy resigned as his chief of staff so he could join the campaign in this final stretch. Mike Erasmussen says it raises a lot of questions. It's an indication that they don't think that they've got the job done, right? They, it's an indication that they're taking nothing for granted, that they're pulling out all the stops. Do you expect to see President Biden stop in New Jersey at some point before this race is over? I don't think President Biden brings anything specifically to the table other than the focus that President Biden is here. Murray says for Murphy, it's all about energizing voters to come out and reminding them they're not just voting for him, but voting against a return to the Trump era. And that's the message Chitterelli is trying to navigate around. There's a little bit of a different calculation that you've got to make in terms of, yes, I've still got to drive out my Republican base. And do I cost myself those un affiliated voters or those Democratic voters if I drive up the Republican message, rah, rah, rah. And with Democrats outnumbering Republicans in the state by more than a million, it's all about who turns out to the polls that open for early voting on Saturday, October 23rd, the very same day former President Obama will be in town stumping for the governor. But mail-in ballots are already trickling in. Right now, there are 106,000 more Democratic votes 
in so far than Republican votes. The really good news for Republicans is that they're returning a little bit more of them by rate, you know, a, a higher rate of return uh, on, of, of, request, of their requested ballots. But it's way too early to start counting any leads just yet. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Joanna Gagas. Now, turning to the Chitterelli campaign, did the gubernatorial debate give the challenger a bump? What's his strategy in these last few weeks before the election? Can Chitterelli tighten the gap? Our chief political correspondent, Michael Aaron, went on the record with the chairman of New Jersey's Republican Party, Bob Hugan. Republican State Chairman Bob Hugan, thanks for joining us. There are 18 days to go until the election. Nine points separate Phil Murphy and Jack Chatterelli in the most recent independent poll. They held their final debate this week, uh, produced by NJPBS. Did Chatterelli close the gap at all that night? First of all, I don't think it's a nine point race. If you look at the money that the Democrats are spending in districts all across the state, Steve Sweeney, half a million bucks. When was the last time you heard that happen to, for his own seat? And Jill Biden's coming in and you got Barack Obama, you've got Kamala Harris. They're worried and they're rightfully worried because the Democratic agenda, this progressive big government socialist takeover of our economy is turning people off and Jack is doing a great job. Are you Republicans in New Jersey being dragged down by the national Republicans, Donald Trump, Mitch McConnell, and so on? I have to tell you, for the first time in a long time, it's nice to have a tailwind when you've got a president in the White House that has a 38% approval rating, who's devastated our foreign relations in Afghanistan, 13 people killed in that, the COVID overreach, the economy, inflation. It's about time we've seen the issues. We've got a tailwind. We don't have a headwind anymore. So we're very encouraged by what we're seeing. Everybody is so upset with how the president has embarrassed our country internationally. The economy is in, in damage. He's now begging oil companies to lower oil prices after bragging about cutting off drilling and stopping natural, natural gas production. We need a balanced economic program, and we're not getting that out of Washington. And the people in New Jersey are starting to feel that pinch, and I think they're gonna vote that way. The pandemic is still bedeviling the world. A lot of people seem to think that Phil Murphy has done a pretty good job managing the pandemic in New Jersey. How do you counter that? Yeah, you know, Michael, I, I think you're, some of the polls indicate that, but it's pretty hard when you look into it to really believe it. With thousands of uh, veterans and, and elderly and the senior citizen long-term care people who were killed, died because of bad policies, a third of our small businesses devastated, kids having lost a year of education, to say you're proud of that, that's not a very good statement to run on. In fact, at the debate on Tuesday night down in, in Rowan, it was really sort of embarrassing to see the governor never run on his record, didn't highlight the things he'd achieved. He attacked the challenger, which was surprising for a guy who's had four years to build a track record. It's still a tall order for Jack Cedarelli to win the election, is it not? I, you know, I don't think so, Michael. I, I think, listen, it's always a challenge. New Jersey is a tough state. You're running against an incumbent. But Jack is really a likable guy. And the more he, people meet him, he's a normal guy. In fact, when you look at the numbers, when people know Phil Murphy and know Jack Cittarelli, Jack wins by more than 20 points. So the question is, is he going to get to enough people, see enough people, enough people get to know and meet him and see him to win by, by November 2nd? I'm optimistic he's going to. I, only, I do think he's down a couple of points, not nine. This is a real toss-up right now. Republican State Chairman Bob Hugan, thanks so much for giving us your point of view. Thank you, Michael. The New Jersey Cannabis Regulatory Commission held a meeting today to announce the applicants that will receive the 2019 round of medical licenses. The process got delayed because of litigation and the pandemic. Leah Mishkin watched live with one of the candidates and Leah was quite emotional, right? Yeah, it was heartbreaking because, you know, you're watching this live with an applicant who has put in this application all the way in 2019. He thought it would take maybe six months to find out if he was awarded a medical license. 
and uh, it's been more than two years that he's been waiting for this. On top of that, the 93ID founder and his team have spent more than $500,000 because in order to maintain a good standing on his application over the past two years, he needed to rent a space where the business would operate, but he hasn't been able to sell any product. It's been two years of just uh, energy and emotion and commitment and stories. Um, so yeah, I mean, we're, we're finally here. I'm excited, but I, 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 to be honest with you, I'm, I'm nervous. He's not alone in those feelings. There were 147 applicants waiting to see if they would be part of the medical marijuana expansion in the state. As encouraging as it is to hear that medical cannabis can have a positive impact on a patient's life, it's equally as discouraging to hear that the market is not meeting their needs. Today, we have an opportunity to change that. We have an opportunity to make this a patient-centered system where access, choice, and accessibility are cornerstones of New Jersey's medical cannabis market. So today, the Cannabis Regulatory Commission recommended doubling the proposed cultivation awards from five awards to 10. And those awardees were told they have to be in the medical space for one year before they can move into the recreational market. Then vertically integrated licenses were announced. Vertical allows for cultivation, manufacturing, and retail and the CRC decided to award two licenses in the central region because they said it's based on need. Then there was one awarded in the south and one awarded in the north. Unfortunately, 93ID was not on that list. They increased the number of cultivation. They could also increase vertical because that gives you dispensary and cultivation and manufacturing, which make which makes sense, you know. I have to look at our application to have more to say, but I'm extremely disappointed. We, you know, they could have done more over the last two years. They just like, there's a score. What about, you know, compensation or some sort of, you know, advice? He told us he was, you know, of course, disappointed, overwhelmed by the whole situation. And uh, he has to figure out what his next steps are, just like all the other applicants who weren't awarded one of these licenses. And he told us for him, he's going to talk to his team. They're going to figure out if they want to apply for, you know, a recreational marijuana license, what kind they want to apply for. And they're also thinking about litigation because they took a major financial hit by waiting those two years. Rhonda. Thanks, Leah. An FDA advisory committee voted unanimously today to recommend a booster dose of Johnson & Johnson's COVID-19 vaccine. The panel recommends that the booster come at least two months after individuals receive the one-shot J&J vaccine and that the second dose be available for those who are 18 years and older. The same committee yesterday recommended booster shots of the Moderna vaccine for those 65 years and older, six months after the initial doses. The FDA usually follows the advice of the committee and it could make a decision within days. After that, a vaccine advisory group of the CDC meets to make its recommendation. In New Jersey, we're closing in on 6 million fully vaccinated residents with nearly 297,000 people receiving third doses or boosters. In tonight's Spotlight on Business, the great workplace exodus continues as we learned this week that a record 4.3 million workers left their jobs in August. In particular, it's women who are walking away. Experts say one of the main reasons for that is a lack of childcare. The Murphy administration has announced it will provide $700 million for childcare centers to expand their hours and increase pay for their workers. Melissa Rose Cooper explores whether the new funding is enough to fix both a childcare and a workplace crisis. I think that we need to think about um, policies that help create a more inclusive economy, because while the economy is working for, you know, some people we've clearly seen the pandemic has highlighted this kind of all these structural inequalities that we have in our economy. Inequalities, Deborah Lancaster, executive director of the Center for Women and Work at Rutgers University, says are driving more women to quit their jobs or not return to the workforce. According to a report published by the Center in December, 51% of accommodation and food service workers and 77% of those working in healthcare and social assistance are women. 
Those are the industries hit the hardest by unemployment claims. Another reason is um, because access to um, child care and K through 12 education was completely upended. Um, and I think we're still recovering from that. There is a child care crisis that about sums it up. Uh, families are having a great deal of difficulty finding child care, which prevents them from working and it impacts much harder on women. A recent report published by Council from a Strong America shows 19% of mothers in New Jersey with young children left the workforce because they couldn't find quality childcare. And right now, the number of women working is the lowest it's been in the state in more than 30 years. It's an issue that's even impacted Congresswoman Mikey Sherrill, a mother of four. With many business owners asking for assistance with the staffing crisis, the Congresswoman has told those owners childcare has had just as much an impact on staffing as unemployment benefits. I think you're underestimating the impact of childcare and kids not being in school and how hard this has hit people. And I had one gentleman even tell me, Mikey, don't believe that that's just a talking point. And I said, okay, I'm gonna stop you there because guess what? I'm a mom of four kids and I'm having childcare issues. My in-laws have moved in with me. I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing if they hadn't been able to do that for, for us. Governor Murphy hoping to ease some of these issues by dedicating $700 million in funding to daycare centers. It's part of the state's $6.2 billion received from the American Rescue Plan. The goal is to help lower costs for families as well as give daycares the financial support they need to retain and hire staff. We hear from childcare programs across the state that they just can't find staff to work in the classrooms and that many programs have empty classrooms. Um, they could serve more children, but they don't have staff to work in those classrooms. They don't have the teachers, the aides that they need. A degree in early education yields the lowest wages of any other college degree. So nobody's going to school to learn how to do our profession. So we're, we're losing from both ends. And you also can't live off of the compensation of early education. So obviously then we're having a hard time retaining. Daycare centers will be able to apply for grants in the upcoming months. Child advocates say it's a great first step to expanding access so working mothers can get the support they need. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Melissa Rose Cooper. Join me this weekend for NJ Business Beat. We're putting New Jersey's real estate market in focus, analyzing the high sales prices, the state of inventory, and new construction. Plus, we are looking at ways to tackle our affordable housing crisis and offering advice for first-time homebuyers. You can find it on NJ PBS Saturdays at 5 p.m. and Sundays at 9.30 in the morning. Now here's a look at the closing numbers today on Wall Street. Members of the anti-government group known as Oath Keepers are a focus for federal prosecutors investigating January's storming of Capitol Hill. The group has been around for more than a decade and apparently in New Jersey, many have joined it over the years, including members of law enforcement and other officials. That's the finding of a new investigative report written by Joseph Jedian, a reporter at WNYC Gothamist. We spoke to him as part of our ongoing series, Exploring Hate, looking at anti-Semitism, racism, and extremism. Joseph, when you started to do your reporting on this, just how widespread is this situation with law enforcement officials and others being members of the Oath Keepers? We uh, started digging into this uh, a couple weeks ago when we got a data dump from, and it showed around 500 members of the Oath Keepers here in New Jersey. Now, uh, we were able to independently verify uh, 20 police officers active or active within the last two years here in New Jersey, and that's, that's across the state. And uh, we were also able to find uh, firefighters, EMTs, first responders, people with militia, military experience. 
uh, you know, and we've even found some government workers. So it's it's really all across uh, New Jersey. So what was the reaction when you started reaching out to officials such as the attorney general, for instance? When we reached out to the attorney general, uh, they told us that it was concerning and they were going to look into it. The important thing is that here in New Jersey, we don't have uh, a law, a state law preventing law enforcement from being here in uh, being in extremist groups. So uh, right now, as it stands, uh, there are no repercussions that we can expect. Uh, but the AG did say that they were going to look into it, he did say he was going to look into it. And uh, the Hudson County prosecutor also mentioned that they would be looking into it. What attracts law enforcement personnel and others to the Oath Keepers? The Oath Keepers are told that uh, this group is the one for them if they want to join, if they want to protect the Constitution, right? Uh, it's in the name, and the name. Uh, comes from their protection of the oath that they take with the military, right? So a lot of this is marketed towards uh, law enforcement, retired law enforcement. The people that we called and we reached out to, they told us that they wanted, some of the ones that did pick up the phone told us that, or responded via email, told us that they wanted an uh, alternative take on the news, you know, the Oath Keepers right uh, articles on their website. Uh, some of them told us that they wanted to uh, protect people who couldn't protect themselves. They wanted, they were pushing for uh, protecting the constitution, you know, so uh, the, those are all things that uh, uh, are being marketed towards uh, these people that joined this uh, really extremist group, militia. Joseph, thank you for sharing some of the findings in your story with me. Thank you. Rhonda, thank you so much. The COVID-19 pandemic left many problems in its wake, especially in urban centers. What is the way forward? That will be explored next week when American Cities Rebuilding returns with discussions on the urban economy, healthcare, cities of the future, and more. NJ Spotlight News founding editor and education writer John Mooney joins me now. John, what's behind American Cities Rebuilding? Yeah, it's something we, we actually started uh, several years ago and, and hosted the, the very first one. It was called Spotlight on Cities. Uh, this is like five or six years ago when we hosted that in, in, in Newark, uh, a live event at NJ Pack. Uh, it was a great success um, and we, didn't keep going for a couple of years. And then uh, last year we thought we'd revive it. And we planned a, a live conference again, uh, this one called American Cities Rebuilding. And then pandemic hit. And uh, it, it obviously forced us into a virtual setting. And, and, but still something that we thought was really important uh, to our mission and, and, and to journalism and bringing issues of the cities uh, forward. And this is the second one. And we've taken it uh, broader. Uh, last year was, largely the tri-state area in New York and New Jersey. This one, we're going national. Uh, and we've teamed up with three stations, PBS stations across the country in Seattle, Chicago, and uh, what's the third one? Houston. And, um, you know, really trying to blow it out and, and make it a national event. Again, focusing on urban issues and some of the challenges facing a lot of cities coming out of the pandemic. So, John, what are some of those big issues that we're seeing right now? Yeah, there's so many. I mean, we're doing five days of this, three three hours a day, uh, ten different blocks. Uh, things like education, uh, healthcare, and COVID, uh, leadership during crisis, uh, economic development, immigration, uh, climate, and you know, we we don't even have enough time. We could do a, a full conference on each of those, but um, it's it's certainly uh, plenty of challenges out there for cities, and we hope to explore a few of them. And John, who will we be hearing from? Yeah, it's a great lineup. Um, we have a bunch of mayors, half dozen uh, mayors, including uh, Newark's mayor, Raz Baraka. We have lawmakers, officials on the federal level. We have uh, former President George W. Bush even making a cameo for us, experts, academics, arts leaders, including the heads of uh, Museum of Modern Art and Juilliard and Alvin Ailey. Uh, it's, a, it's a great mix of folks and, and having conversations uh, that I think are going to be provocative and really interesting. 
and certainly very important. John, thank you so much. We look forward nice to it. Hearing. Thank you. You too can experience this five-day virtual event. Head to the American Cities Rebuilding website to register. Don't miss it. That does it for us this evening. If you missed any of the big stories this week, you can catch Reporters Roundtable with David Cruz Saturday at 6 p.m. and Sunday at 10 a.m. Along with Chat Box, it airs Saturday at 6.30 p.m. and Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m. I'm Rhonda Schapler. Have a great weekend. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And the Ocean Wind Project by Orsted and PSEG, committed to the creation of a new long-term sustainable clean energy future for New Jersey. Major funding for Exploring Hate has been provided by the Sylvia A. and Simon B. Poiter Programming Endowment to Fight Anti-Semitism, the Peter G. Peterson and Joan Gans Cooney Fund, and Patty Asquith Kenner.